I'm here with Andrew Bastara, CEO and founder of Peak Vision, a social enterprise using smartphone tech to bring eye care to people in the world's most remote and underserved communities. So Andrew, you grew up with visual impairment. How did that influence your approach to creating accessible eye care solutions? When I was growing up, I didn't know I couldn't see. So the, the first thing was just having the experience of being told I was not very smart. And it took about two years for someone to realize that the reason I was failing at school was that I couldn't see. Mm. You find a way to get around things. You get closer to the blackboard. You copy the person sat next to you. Yeah. And at about the age of 12, I was taken for an eye test. And that moment completely changed my life. As I was there with the optometrist putting the individual trial lenses in, I suddenly noticed this smudge of what had been the, the board with all the letters on suddenly snapped into focus. And I'd never seen anything in focus before. And whilst I still had the trial lenses on, they said, go and stand outside and tell me what you can see. I went and stood and looked across the car park and suddenly saw trees had leaves on them. And it was unbelievable. Everything changed. I saw stars for the first time. The blackboard went from being this smudged, everything was clear. And people stopped telling me that I didn't have much of a future. They started telling me that my future could be bright. That small intervention, a pair of glasses, something 700 years old, completely changed my life. I'd made this move from being an eye surgeon to practicing public health. And my wife and I then moved to Kenya. The idea was we'd set up these hundred eye clinics, see as many people as we could, get as much information as we could as to what barriers people were facing. And what became clear is the number of people who could be treated were huge. And most of them had a problem that could be treated in moments, but finding them was a problem. And we were only finding them because we were out in these remote locations and we were there with a team of 15 people, lots of expensive kit worth over a hundred thousand pounds. And the reality is that wasn't sustainable, but what was, becoming more and more apparent as the need was huge and most people like me didn't know that they had the opportunity to see. And so we needed to think of a way of how do you actually go to people and not only do an accurate test, but then connect them into the system that can treat them. We were working in locations where there was no electricity, there was no water, there was no road access, but there was good mobile signal. Maybe this is an opportunity to bridge that gap between those who are unseen and those who can treat them. And that's where the idea to start trying different things. And the first idea was, could we use a smartphone to replicate all of this kit that I had? So Wired wrote about you, I think, in around 2015. What kind of changes have you made in the platform, getting that feedback from it being out there in the field? Back in 2015, the thing we were most known for was this really exciting bit of hardware we were testing, which you could put on the phone, you could hold it up to someone's eye, and you could see the inside of their eye. And it was incredible. However, being in the midst of it, I learned the hard way that it, as it wasn't actually going to solve the problem. Diagnosing someone with a problem is not the same as treating them. Yeah. And it was the gap between decision to go to treatment and actually getting a treatment where we realized most people fell out of the system, at least 80%. It was shifting from delivering innovations to innovating delivery. And that was, that was where things changed on the back of that. What have you learned about healthcare delivery in rural communities? that maybe weren't apparent from your earlier clinical work? When you're a clinician, you're always busy. I mean, I don't know any doctor who I've trained with who ever says I don't have enough work. But when you step back, you start to see who's not coming to the hospital. So the shift is going from looking at who's in front of you versus who needs to come and doesn't know you're there. So how do you balance those two things, like the technical developments of the app, but also the humans in the field who have these challenges? What we've learned is technology isn't the answer. Mm. As much as it can build interest, hype, or be an enabler, it's the intersect of technology and compassion where things happen. For example, in the early days when we were first prototyping in Kenya, we found a large number of people, despite us covering the cost of the key barriers, which were the cost of surgery and the transport, still at least half weren't coming. And when I looked at the data, it was clear there was a particular ethnic group who were not coming. And so when I started to observe how our field team were talking to them, they were having to translate from English to Swahili to a local language. Mm. And there was a certain word being used. And when I asked my team, what, what, word, what does that mean? They said it means operation or surgery. But I'd often see the patient look a bit concerned at that point. 
I heard the same word used in a different context. And when I asked, what does that word that you just said mean? They said it means butchery. And so patients were hearing, it's free, we'll cover the transport, and then we're going to butcher your eye. So not surprisingly, they didn't come. So the change of a word, which was from butchery to fix, meant nearly all of them started coming. Technology couldn't solve that problem, but it could point to where the problem was so that by paying attention and being present for people, you could start to pick up these things. So a lot of the philosophy of what we've built into Peak is that technology will help us understand the problem, but people will solve it. And I'd love to know if there are you know, other discoveries that you've made that maybe you just didn't anticipate when you first started putting your vision into practice. The lesson is you never get to a point where it's all okay. It's been problem after problem, but the key thing is that the problems are evolving. So when I look and reflect on how we're doing, if we've got the same problem we had months ago, we are the, we are the problem. If we've got a new problem, we should be celebrating because it means we've broken down a barrier. If you like, the problem we face today is demand for what we're doing. 10 years ago when we spoke, the problem was I was selling a dream, a vision of something we hope might happen one day. That time I'd just come back from living in Kenya, we'd seen and treated 7,000 people across two years. In the last month, through Peak, our partners have reached two thirds of a million people. The people who are at the sharp end of this are local healthcare workers. How has your training of local healthcare workers developed? What we are realizing is they are actually the entry point to the health system for the people that they're examining. And maybe I'll give you an example. When this was first starting in Kenya, there was a, a man called Philip who had been a village elder, but he'd slowly just started pulling back. And for three years, he'd kind of not engaged with the community at all. And he didn't know, and no one else knew, the reason he wasn't doing that was because he couldn't see. Someone from our team knocked on his door, did an eye test, and then gave him hope that actually you could get your sight back. He went from having effectively given up, having heard his daughters struggling next door, having heard a grandchild being born and never seen him, to the next day going and having a five minute operation where he went there using a stick to get there. He came back carrying the stick like, mm -hmm. You know, this, I don't need this anymore. And there was just beautiful moment coming home where not only did he see his daughters, he saw his grandson for the first time. It's those moments where you realize that connection didn't happen because of the technology. It happened because somebody went to his front door and was enabled to do what, what they did through the technology. And so we are learning more and more, how do we equip that person on the front line to get better and better, give them the data they need, the insight they need to find more Phillips again and again and again. And that's what we're doing now, we're seeing more than 100,000 people a week getting an eye test for the first time. Can you just show us how the app works? So let me show you what a normal vision test looks like yeah. and why we needed to redesign it. So big letter at the top gets smaller. Yeah. Now this requires a few things. You as the person being tested have to be literate. So one thing we learned is we had to test for vision, not literacy. So having standard letters was a problem. But also the examiner has to actually understand a lot. So I would have to point You'd have to give me the answer. I would have to, in my mind, record if you gave me the right or wrong answer. I would then move, know when to move to the next line. I need to know what happens if you give me two right and one wrong. Do I stop there? Do I carry on? What if you get two right and two right here? When do I stop the test? And um, when I'm giving the test, how do I remain objective, not giving you clues like, you know, giving you a front, are you sure? Yeah. And then how do I actually score it? What does the result mean and what do I do with it? So there's actually lots going on. And if we want to have lots of people be able to accurately identify people with vision loss, this wasn't going to work. So what we did is we used first principles to redesign the test in, in an app. So here you can see an object that looks like a letter M. So as the examiner, I would just ask you, which way are the legs pointing? And I would get you to point. So if you point, which way are they going? So all I have to do is mimic you. So I just swipe whichever way it's pointed. That's where my vision is. <laughs> OK. And you've taken your glasses off, I see, as well. Yeah, exactly. Pop your glasses on. Let's see if you can. Uh... Let's give that a go. All right. Getting better now. See, they do work, don't they? They do work. And I got a vibration there so that I now know the test is finished and it's told me your, your score. Obviously, I'm much closer than I would be doing this. So as the assessor, I just have to be smartphone literate. So we've designed this so that an eight-year-old who can use a smartphone could assess vision as accurately 
as an eye doctor with the, with the standard chart. How far away would you normally be in the field? Uh, so the standard test is three metres, but we've built an algorithm that means you can also run it at two metres. Okay. And we use a piece of string to make sure you're the right distance. Okay. Wow. So an eight-year-old can use a piece of string. You know, that's ingenious. So obviously over the last decade, we've seen the kind of inexorable rise of artificial intelligence, and we've seen lots of applications of it in healthcare. Um, how do you think that AI is going to be applied in, in diagnostics moving forward? I'm optimistic and cautious, particularly in the areas where we work, in the countries that we, we are focused on. The risk is it's going to make the gap bigger. I've recently seen some amazing demos of augmented reality glasses, but the tragic reality is close to a billion people who need an ancient pair of glasses still are not getting them. And so whilst I'm really excited by the potential to look and see a, a map in real time, I'm a bit more concerned about are we mapping a trajectory towards actually finding people who don't get these basic treatments. And we're doing work ourselves. Uh, we're looking at can we use AI to assess somebody at the household as to whether or not they have a cataract that's operable. Because at the moment, what happens in our workflow is they get assessed with having vision loss at home. Yeah. They get sent somewhere else for a diagnosis. And if it's confirmed as cataract, they get sent to the hospital. So each journey is a chance for them to fall out of the system. Yeah, yeah. If we can make that one journey, we might double the number of people that get care. At the moment, what I'm seeing most of the use in healthcare is around optimizing the workflow for the clinician, which is a good use, but I'm more interested now in terms of what happens outside the hospital, how to get people in, into the system. Yeah, I'd love to dig into that a little bit in terms of like how you measure impact. Obviously, there's one data point, which is the number of screenings that you're conducting. But how do you think more broadly about the impact that you're having? We look at how many people need to be tested, how many of them have been tested, of those tested, how many had a problem? Mm. Of those that had a problem and were referred for care, how many reached care? And then how many that reached care get a good outcome? We think of it as five A's. Are they aware that the problem they have is treatable? If they're aware, do they know it's available? And if so, well, like where to go, when to go there? If it's available, is it accessible? What are the kind of barriers that they're facing that would prevent them from going there? If it's accessible, is it attractive? Yeah. They're felt motivation to go has to be greater than the resistance that they might have against it. And then finally, is it affordable? And we, we're very fortunate to partner with very generous people and organisations who cover the cost of patients who can't pay. But we know the problem is so big that won't solve it long term. So that now is becoming a real focus for us is how do you scale sustainably? And how has the Rolex Award helped you in your journey? Rolex got behind us at a very early stage. You know, it's almost uh, eight, nine years ago. Many people have no idea that eye care is even an issue, but if you turn around and ask any audience what would happen if you couldn't wear your glasses, most people wouldn't be able to function. So it's one of these paradoxes. It's, it's so solvable, everyone assumes it's been solved. And so when you work with an organization like Rolex, who have such an incredible brand, it elevates the issue space we're in. And they've helped make these beautiful films to narrate and articulate the story and the journey that we're on. There, there's been three different ones now, and, and each time it's really helped people understand the work that we're doing. Yeah, and that storytelling part is, is so important, and we've really enjoyed telling your story uh, over the years and look forward to telling it in the future. Thank you very much. Thanks for being with us. Thanks.